All right, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm happy to talk about some recent work that was just posted to the archive, done in collaboration with Shahar Hadar and Al. So before I dive into the exact topic of my talk today, let me contextualize it a bit by just talking about black holes more generally. Of course, black holes are very ubiquitous uh, in our universe. There's a supermassive one at the center of every galaxy, and there are even more solar mass black holes, uh, I believe about 10 million in our own Milky Way or so. And recently we've been ushered into a new era of exciting work for observational astrophysics with experiments like LIGO and the EHT, which means for me as a physicist, one of the interesting things that I can think about particularly our observational signatures, that hallmark that we're looking at black holes. Of course, these can be things like the waveforms that LIGO detects for black hole mergers. Um, of course, M87 was launched at EHT. Like I said, they were able to take an image of the emission near M87 star, the most up close image we have of the region near the horizon of a black hole. And here's that image that they were able to generate on April 6th when they turned all these telescopes in concert to look at the center of Miser 87, which is a behemoth uh, that is one of our neighboring galaxies. So when you look at a black hole such as M87 star, you see a bright ring with this deficit in brightness in the center. So that's another observational signature. And particularly black holes are very interesting in that when we think about observing them, we have to consider the fact that one of the exotic behaviors they allow for is that light can wind multiple times around them before traveling, before reaching the observer when it travels from the source where it was emitted. And so here is a video from math for a black hole with an equatorial accretion disk where we're changing the angle from which we're viewing it. Here we're viewing it close to the pole, the spin axis. And then we'll see we go back towards the horizon uh, for a viewing angle. And in all these pictures, a nice interesting thing is that you can see both sides of the disk because light is allowed to bend quite a lot on its path from source to observer. So if you're an observer far away and my hand uh, has a black hole here and we have a disk, you can see the top side of the disk, but you can also see light that bends from below and see the bottom side of the disk. And in particularly, what we expect for such an image is something like this. This is an image video, excuse me, created by uh, the CFA here at Harvard, where they show the light that was the direct light that had no bending in its path around the black hole, one that had one bending, and now we're seeing the one that has two. And you see that altogether, the light that bends different amounts of times winding around the black hole come together to make an image of a black hole with a bright ring. And because it's the same source, we can get a self-similar image superimposed on top of itself of the emission region around a black hole. This is uh, another observational signature that was recently described known as the photon uh, ring. And of course, there's also the observational signature that I'm going to talk about today uh, that we're proposing to be used called the maximum observable blue shift. As you might surmise from the title of my talk, we're gonna investigate in this talk how the Kerr black hole spin and the inclination from which we're viewing it are encoded in the maximum observable blue shift from all the light that is, accrete that is emitted from matter accreting onto the black hole that the observer is able to view. So because I'm gonna be talking about the maximum observable blue shift, let me talk about the broadening of single frequency emission from around a black hole. black hole accretion disks tend to have a lot of iron and one of the things when you know a specific element is present is you can look for the single frequencies it emits in its spectrum as it tries to drop its energy back down when it's excited. One of these particularly targeted lines is the K-alpha iron line. So in the frame of the emitters all in the in the accretion disk the light is emitted with a single frequency but because the light is in a gravitational uh, well, it is close to a black hole. As it travels from source to observer, it incurs gravitational redshift. 
Additionally, there's also Doppler shifting because of the motion of the sources in the disk. Some are moving towards the observer, thus having that the emission as seen by the observer blue shifted in frequency, and some are moving away and thus causing a redshift in the observed frequency that the observer sees. This causes overall the single emission frequency to be broadened into a whole line profile. And using this method to constrain the spins of black holes has already been done to some degree for about 20 or so black holes. And it's called, if you're wondering, the X-ray reflection method. Particularly today, because I'm a theorist and I want to do bare bones, um, and I want something analytically tractable, I'm going to consider a Kerr black hole with an equatorial disk where the emitters are on the stable circular orbits. This means the disk will terminate before the horizon at what is called the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit. And also I'm going to assume that the disk is transparent. I'll come back to this a little later, but the reason I need this transparency condition is because it means I'm allowed to consider light that has wound multiple times, even though it must cross back through the accretion disk in the equatorial plane before reaching the observer. If the disk was completely opaque, only direct emission that never crosses the equatorial plane would be uh, because it would be reabsorbed if it tried to pass back through the equatorial plane. So now let me give you an example of some broadened line profiles with this disk model. This is a very well studied disk model because of its tractability. So there exists some general role relativistic ray tracing codes like Reline by Dowser that are able to take these parameters into account and give you the broadened profile of emission for such an accretion disk around a Kerr black hole. And here we see I'm presenting for you the line profiles at two different inclination angles, 30 degrees, where zero is looking down the spin axis or the pole, and 85 degrees, so this is closer to the equatorial plane viewing angle, where, of course, viewing from 90 degrees would be viewing directly from the equator. And of course, I've presented these for multiple different spins. Let me say for you that you can see marked here is the emission frequency in the frame of the emitter, the K alpha 6.4 keV. And let me tell you also that this Y axis is arbitrary. These curves are just normalized for height. You shouldn't try to surmise anything from their relative heights. So if we look at these curves, the maximum observable blue shift, of course, would be the rightmost edges of these curves. And if we look at them for these two different observer inclinations that I presented here, they present some interesting questions. First of all, one question is about uh, the, the, the low inclinations. We see for the low inclinations that they have a common value of, of the mob. We see that here, all the right-hand sides, the mob, are all at the same value, and it's a value relatively close to the emission frequency in the emitter frame. We also see that for a higher inclination, this is no longer the case that it's a common value. In fact, the mob is now spin dependent. We see for a low range of spins from about zero to 60 degrees that the, that the mob values are increasing with spin but that is not monotonic along the whole range because if we look in the range from 80 and 90 and 97, we see that it's no longer ordered by increasing spin. So this presents some interesting questions like for low inclination of observing, why is the mob a common value and what is the common value? Why does it become spin independent as we increase our inclination? And then you could ask at a fixed inclination, what spin would give you the largest mob? or conversely, at a fixed spin, what would give you the highest mob? So to answer this question, what we're going to do is thinking, if you think about that video I showed you about how the black hole looks to an observer, where we can see the disk, we're going to parameterize that disk. We're going to think about the image we see of the disk, and we're going to parameterize it by its redshift value and uh, the source radius from which we got it. So let me just say we're going to use the Kerr metric and we're going to work in boyer lindquist coordinates when I talk about uh, the source radius. And also let me remind you that 
In the curved geometry, there are some curved conserved quantities for photon. Of course, there's the energy, which I haven't mentioned. It really just relates to an overall multiplying factor uh, of the momentum of a photon. But really, the direction the photon reaches the observer is defined is dependent on these two quantities, lambda, which is the angular momentum around the z-axis, and another conserved quantity known as the Carter constant, eta. So in the geometry, you can go into the um, orbiter frame, the emitter frame, and look at the circular, the light emitted from the circular orbits, and that allows you to figure out that the redshift for an observer at, at infinity, so far from the black hole, takes on this form. Where we see it depends on the emission radius of the, so the source of the source radius, as well as the angular momentum of the photon. And we also find that it's monotonic. The plus min ha minus has to do with whether the, the the orbit, the stable circular orbit is prograde or retrograde. Later on in the talk, we're going to specialize to only the prograde orbits. Another thing I said that we wanted to do is just parameterize the disk also by the source radius. Um, we indeed can write the source radius of light we see on the observer screen in terms of where it appears on the screen. These are Cartesian coordinates for this alpha and beta. And these, in fact, are related to the conserved quantities of the photon, lambda and eta, as follows. And then also, um, it depends on this value g, which comes from inverting the Kerr geodesic equation. Let me note that there's also this parameter that appears in g, that is m bar. m bar is an integer that numbers which number, uh, which number of windings the path from the source to the observer has. Remember I said, in, the Kerr, in, in black hole geometries, so the, the case is true for the Kerr geometry, that there are multiple paths light can take from a source to the observer, depending on how many times it winds around the black hole. And in fact, this number is an integer, but it goes up to infinity, even though subsequent number of windings in an image, higher and higher, means the image will be dimmer and dimmer. So now we know how to parameterize the disk based on the redshift, as well as the source radius and which, uh, which image of the black hole accretion disk it appears on. Using this, it becomes easy to figure out what the maximum or minimum redshift value for a given source radius and image of the disk M bar is. It turns out that we can, because we know how lambda is related to alpha, we can plug this in and we see that because the redshift is monotonic, it's simply that we need the left or rightmost points alpha on our screen to have the lambda that's going to maximize g. And we can plug that lambda into g and let me show you, so I'm not just talking about equations, what this looks like. So an example of a disk parameterized by the redshift and source radius, and the mob is marked as well and these images are given here. Here is the number equals zero image. We see here in purple, these curves, these curves are constant radii, boyer lindquist radii in the, in the geometry, while these black lines here are lines of constant redshift or blue shift. We also have the interior here, which is black, um, because this is the interior of the horizon. There's a little gap between the edge of the disk and the interior of the horizon. Remember I said our disk is ending at the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit, and not at the horizon. We also have the same parameterization from, for the next image of the disk, given here. Um, and this is the underside of the disk. And we see that it has its bluest region here. If I am to zoom in and I find the mob, the mob on this image here, on the first image, the direct image, turns out to have a value of 1.36. Well, on the other hand, it's not marked with a dot because the curves get so close, but it's right pugged up to the ISCO here. The mob on the first image, the first lensed image, the M bar equals one, is a higher value of 1.42. And so this is why I need to specify that I want to consider a disk that is transparent because I do want to consider the case of having the mob have the value it would on subsequent images if they are higher than the direct image. <laughs> 
So of course, calculating the mob is as simple as taking my disk. I know how to write G max for each radius and each image. So on a single image, this is just collecting all the leftmost points of, the, of these curves of constant radius in the geometry and finding which one gives me the max. And I could do the same, look along all the curves, look along their, the constant R curves and look for their leftmost points and I can find a blue shift. Uh, numerically, we do this in several steps though. This is not something that can be done in general um, very easily analytically, but there are special cases I will tell you that we are able to find, but we can do it numerically. So first we find this value, the G max for a given source radius and image. Then we do the maximization over the radi all the radii to find the mob on each image. That's this dot here and this point here. And then of course the subsequent images. And then of course we maximize over the mob value, the image mobs we get for all different M. In practice, we actually truncate this maximization. We don't have to somehow try to do some maximization where we go all the way up to infinity. Um, it turns out we can max, we can truncate this maximization using this value that's m bar star because we analytically know how to calculate it. Bar is the image on which we get the mob for the equatorial viewer. And it turns out for all other viewers, the mob will always be on the image that has the mob for the equatorial viewer or a lower image, m bar. So here are our numerical result, results. Here are our curves. Let me explain them to you in detail. So first of all, on the, on the axis here, the horizontal axis, I have the observer inclinations. I have the mob on the or, uh, vertical axis. And then in different colors, I have the value of the mob for different spins. Let me say the, the top panel are all showing the spins listed here. And this right hand side is uh, just the zoomed in of this area. Below, I have a similar thing where this box here is this. And instead of listing the spins here, I'm listing higher spins. So let me break it down for you because there are also some other things other than the colored curves, as you might see. So let me tell you about what we're seeing. We're seeing that here, we notice there's this black curve. This black curve is an approximation I can make analytically that matches all the curves for low inclinations. As I go to higher inclinations, of course, this approximation breaks down. But I also see these points here that I put along the 90 degree observer angle, uh, angle axis. These points correspond to analytically calculating the value of the mob for these given spins, which remind you, I told you, I also can analytically calculate which image they come from. I see also that I note that by the time I reach the inclination of observing from the equatorial plane, the mob is in fact monotonic in space. As I go down, curves turn over at different points and in this region, they're not necessarily monotonic in spin, which is what we noticed in that broadened emission profile that I showed earlier. For lower, for higher spins, spins above 97, the curves are a little more interesting. Of course, for the low inclinations, there's still this nice match with this analytic curve that I can derive. But there's also, um, we see that there are these kinks in the curve. So here's the one for the purple, the green has its kink here, the blue here, and the red here. The kinks I've shown are where the mob switches from being on the direct image, m bar equals zero, to being on the first lensed image, m bar equals one. I've continued to plot also in dashed the m bar equals one images mobs. The reason I've done this is it's still relevant if I had a disk that was opaque and any photon on a path that winds back multiple times, the equatorial pin would be reabsorbed. And then lastly, I have this this orange dotted curve. This orange dotted curve is the limit, the envelope of what the curve of the mob would be shaped like if I was able to spin the black hole all the way up to maximum spin. And interestingly enough, even though when you do that, the mob would technically come from higher and higher 
images going up to infinity, it's still analytically able to be calculated if you do it very carefully. So this means I can, and for analytic or semi-analytic description, break my mob into different regions, the any spin low inclination that matches my black curve very well, any spin max inclination or 90 degree viewing angle, that's the dots I can analytically calculate and put on the uh, axis here. There's this region here. This region is one I'm going to have to calculate semi-analytically, but knowing information about these first two is going to help me. And then lastly, the orange dotted curve, the high spin, high inclination, I'm able to calculate its envelope. And just as a nice check, the two images I showed you of the broadened line profiles for different viewing angles. Um, I have their rightmost points here plotted against the mob values I've gotten from these calculations to show that they match very well to within 0.2%. So I know that my numerics aren't doing anything crazy. Let me break down a little bit these different regions and how one can analytically or semi-analytically describe what's going on here. So for my any spin low inclination, remember I had that nice black curve. Well, if I look at my numerics, what I learn is the mob came from the direct image, m bar equals zero, and it was also emitted from a source radius that was quite large. Um, this explains why I noticed the values were spin independent. Um, if they're from a large radius, they feel the effect of the black hole less, so they should be spin independent. And I also remember noticed that it was also a relatively low value, um, close to the emission frequency. So this, like I said, lines up with our physical intuition. Um, if we're looking at the disk close to the pole, close to the spin axis, then the motion of the disk is mostly um, perpendicular to the observer. So there's very little blue shift we can get due to the motion of the disk. So this explains the low value. Um, and of course, decreasing radii have um, our at increasing redshift because they're deeper into the gravitational well. So if we want maximum blue shift, we better take a large radii to source our mob. And so let me talk about how I can derive that analytically. So I can, I can um, start from viewing the disk from the pole. If I view the disk from the pole, um, I can write um, the coordinates on the screen alpha and beta. Well, um, in terms of B, or I can write B rather, the impact parameter B in terms of alpha and beta. So each, and if I view directly from the pole, of course, each image of a source ring in the radii is just a perfect circle um, of radius B. Um, so I can take my formula for my source radius and I can expand it around large B. If I do that, what I learned is that my source radius uh, goes like B minus M and it isn't until the third term that the spin comes in. So really, it's, it, this is telling us that to leading order, it's like, uh, it, it, it's, it's, like, it's like flat space. We just would get B. The next order is that we feel the effects of the mass, and then it's not until sub-sub that we feel the effects of the spin, if we are a large, far away radius. This was something that was noticed previously um, by Alex Lipsaska and Sam Grala, where that the impact when viewing from the pole, the impact parameter B was basically the source radius plus M. This is, however, not a coordinate independent statement. This is a statement about the boyer lindquist coordinates. All right, so taking the fact, let's truncate this and take the fact that we're going to say R is roughly B minus M. If we do that, we can approximate the lambda or the alpha, that leftmost point for a given radius um, this, um, in this form. Using that, we can plug this lambda into G max for a given radius. Uh, we can expand again in small um, theta or X in this case. And if we do that, we get that the mob has to come from an R that has roughly this value. Why is this valid? This is valid because if we think about viewing a circle in flat space, um, as we 
go off the pole slightly, the radius is still the width of our ring, that even though the, the up and down direction kind of gets squished, the radius stays about the same in, in, in flat space, it stays exactly the same. For general relativity, of course, it gets squished a little, but as long as we're still close to the, the pole, it's very minor. And so this is why this approximation works, even though we derived this approximation for r being equal to b minus m for exactly the pole. If we do this, we see that our mob has to take uh, form, our radius of mob emission has to take this form. And we can, we instead choose this form of it because it still matches at the first two orders, uh, but improves our match a little bit for a little longer. And what we see is then if we plug this emission radius and this lambda into G, we get that our mob has to come with this form. And here I'm just showing you um, the numerical value of where the mob was emitted for those previous curves I, I showed you um, and marked against my numeric uh, approximation, my analytic approximation. And I'm showing you the lambda from the numerics marked against uh, the approximation. And we see, of course, that for low inclination, it's a very good match. There are other regimes uh, now to talk about. The next one was the points along the axis for the observer who is at the, equi the equator, um, excuse me, the equator. If I look at my numerics, what I learn is that in this case, the ISCO always sources my mob photons. Like I said, when we looked at the plots, it's monotonic in spin. We also learned that it's not always the direct image that gives us the mob. This is the fact that if I looked at the two different rows of my plot earlier when I showed my numerical values calculating the mob, was that for the higher spins, the mob came from a lensed image. And of course, I could also note that the, all the mob curves were monotonic in, uh, at fixed spin, were monotonic in their observer angle. So this value of the mob on the, for the equatorial observer at fixed spin is, is the max. Again, it turns out this lines up with physical intuition. As we increase um, the inclination with which we view the disk, then more of the disk motion is in line with us. And thus, we can get more blue shift from the motion of the disk. And so decreasing radii in the geometry have sources moving at higher speeds. So of course, it's the lower radii, the smaller radii, that can now source the mob because of the relativistic speeds at which the emitters are moving. To analytically calculate these values, what I have to do is go into the frame of the emitter, and I can ask anywhere to the celestial sphere, what is the bluest shift, the most blue shifted photon you emit? I can define local angles in the sky of such an emitter. Um, um, when I do that, I see um, that I can, I can I can solve the equation for G. I haven't shown explicitly how uh, the form of this guy, but it depends on G. And if I invert it, this is the equation I get. It doesn't, however, uh, depend on eta. And unlike that, though, the other angle in the sky does depend on them both. But nicely, like I said, G only depends on the first angle, big psi. So I can maximize big psi and psi is an angle. So I know that um, it can't, that cosine of the angle can only be up to the value of one. When I maximize it, what I find is it's actually psi equals zero that maximizes this G. And it gives this form. And if I learn that psi must be zero, that tells me necessarily that this angle cosine of big theta must equal zero, and so eta is zero. If eta is zero, the, the motion is constrained to be forever in the equatorial plane. So I know the bluest photon emitted to anywhere on the celestial sphere from one of these emitters 
stays in the equatorial plane. And so then I know by deduction that this value of the mob is in fact the mob I get for the equatorial viewer. And what's more, I also told you that I could tell you which image I got this on. So let me explain how you do that. Since we know the value of the mob, we also know the value of its angular momentum. Since I know additionally the form of this equation that tells me when I'm looking at the coordinates alpha and beta on my screen and in the mth bar image what the radi source radius is, I can, I can plug some things in that will help me. First, let me note by symmetry of the image, since it's from the leftmost point um, on, a, on the image of a ring, and because I'm viewing from the equator, the image must be symmetric. That leftmost point must lie on the alpha axis. This tells me that beta must be set to zero. And then of course I know that alpha has to take the form minus lambda max. I know that lambda max has to be the value of my mob, lambda. And then this, if I could invert it, would tell me what m bar star is. I can't easily invert this, but what I can do is I can plug in different values of m bar star, and I can vary a until it gives me the value that is the ISCO. This radius r m s is the ISCO for marginally stable. So when I plug in the different values of m bar star, one, two, three, four, etc., I figure out by varying a which value spits out the ISCO, and that value tells me where the transition happens for my mob being on that value of m bar. So if I do this, what I find is uh, the first transition from the mob when viewed from the equatorial plane being on the direct image to the first line of the image happens for this value of kappa, which is related to the spin as this, which means the spin is about 97.88%. Um, and much higher and higher. Um, I can then fit these points of these A's. I can, I can use them to, uh, I can fit them as a function of kappa of this form where it's a constant plus a constant times log kappa plus a constant times kappa. When I do this, I find that are these numbers here. And of course, to get the proper m bar star, I just need to take the floor of this model function, m bar zero. Remarkably, it turns out this was calculated uh, analytically for the high spin case of the limit taking lambda, uh, excuse me, taking a goes to m. Um, and it was analytically calculated to have this form, which is remarkably close to the form we numerically calculated. All right, so now that I've done those two regimes, the next regime I can do is to talk about the low to moderate spins and the high inclination. This, I re you'll recall, is the area where the curves turn over at different points so that the mob is no longer monotonic in spin. What I learned from my numerics in this regime is that the mob comes, still comes from the direct image, but from smaller radii, though not necessarily the ISCO. They are spin dependent. Um, and at fixed spin, they're monotonically increasing, but not monotonically increasing in spin for fixed inclination. So what I can do is use the other two regimes that I've talked about to help me. I can write the mob in this form. I know this is, this is the value of the mob for the, low, the approximation for low inclination, that black curve I showed you before. And this is the value it has to have when the viewer is observing from the equatorial plane. So then I can try to make some fits to this function kappa and, uh, excuse me, chi, and chi necessarily has the limits that when viewing from the pole, it's zero. When viewing from the equator, it's equal to one. If you're very good at fits, you can make an arbitrarily good fit. Here I've listed a couple for you. One of a simple form where it's basically a Gaussian that matches with my numerics to 1% spins below 90% and for the range of spins from 90 to 97 matches to 4% with more complicated functions I can improve it so that the second region from 90 to 97 is fit to within 2% or I can pick 
for instance, one that the whole range from of spins from zero all the way to 97% uh, is fit to within 1.5% to my numerics. Um, from these, I'm able to do things like create a contour plot. And sorry, the colors are a little backwards for what's bluer and redder, but what I see is that really low inclination, the mob is really because these curves of constant mob are, are straight lines is really only telling me information about the observing angle. However, when I get to higher values of mob, I'm able to constrain the spin and inclination of the black hole in terms of one another. The last region I wanted to tell you about was the high spin, high inclination. So this was the regime where the mob came from a higher um, image m bar, so m bar not equal to zero, one of the lens image. And it also, I learned, comes always from the ISCO, the, the innermost uh, radii that the disk has. Like I said, we were able to calculate that orange curve, that's this limiting behavior. And I'll walk you through briefly how we're able to calculate it. So we can go into what are called Boyer, uh, excuse me, Bardeen Horowitz coordinates. And these coordinates relate the spin as well as the radii close to the horizon um, with a small parameter epsilon and we can take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. When we do this, what we find is that the curve of the, the image of the radii in the disk become this shape where they have this straight line edge, which is called the neckline which appears here. And it turns out the mob images, of course, like we said, are always on these leftmost points of our curves of constant radii in the geometry. So the mob is always somewhere viewed along this neckline. So now we need to figure out where. So to do this, we can solve the geodesic equations for um, what's called neck, the near extreme horizon curve geometry, which is what we get when we take this limit of the curve geometry with epsilon goes to zero. And what we find then is that we can write the maximum, we can write the redshift in terms of the image on which it's on, the radii which sources it, and the position along the neckline. So before it really was that G only depended on lambda, here in the case of neck, the lambda is fixed because we're on this neckline, but the height along the next neckline, since it's not just a point that the curve comes to at its leftmost side, but a line uh, is really what's of interest. So it's eta instead of lambda now that we need to use when we're maximizing. So here I've shown for you for the ISCO, where this R bar, this capital R bar is equal to the value of two to the one third. Uh, when that's plugged in, here I'm showing you curves that show the different eta values uh, when, when you have different, what, what you get as G for different eta values and different M values. So each of these blue curves is a different value M. Here, of course, is their eta, and here, of course, is their, the G that then corresponds. And we see that I'm showing here M's uh, 0 through 30. And we see that for different images M, it's a different gives us uh, the brightest uh, the bluest photon. So we need instead to figure out what this envelope is for these curves. And it turns out the envelope is none other than this M bar, this M zero that I showed you earlier that was calculated for the high spin case that we were able to recover um, numerically to show us for the equatorial observer which value of the with M bar the mob came on to us. And so if I plug this into G, I'm then able to uh, get this form of uh, G0 of beta, or, and beta is just related to eta. Um, and then I can maximize over, over beta. And when I do that, I recover the orange dotted curve that I showed you earlier of this form. So the last thing I want to tell you is you may have noticed from the curves of the Another thing was that on the left-hand side of the broadened profile, uh, broadened line profiles, the curves went down to zero. However, on the right-hand side, the mob, the curves dropped off sharply. They had 
a non-vanishing flux. So that means the, it, the point here has non-vanishing flux, uh, as well as it turns out the flux here. This is the case for every image uh, that, the, that the bluest point of the disk on that image has a non-zero flux. And so let me briefly tell you why that is. We can write the flux in terms of the intensity in the observer frame times the solid angle. We can trade, of course, the solid angle for position on the screen alpha beta. Um, and then it, we can also, uh, with the change of variables, trade it for our parameterization of radius in the disk, as well as redshift. Instead of redshift g, I'm going to use g star here, where it's defined that what for a given radius, we're at its maximum value of, red, of redshift or blue shift, that it will be one and at its reddest value, it'll be zero. All right, so this is what the flux is equal to. I also know from conservation of photon number and phase space that the intensity in the observer frame has to equal the intensity in the source frame times the redshift cubed. That allows me to write the fluxes in this form. Uh, I can then define a function, little f. This is called Cunningham's transfer function. Cunningham studied this problem of parameterizing the disk and trying to figure out the blue shift and red shift from it um, back in the 70s. Um, and he picked this function uh, specifically so that the value you got was relatively independent of the parameters rs. And uh, it has been numerically checked that that this um, that that the flux does in fact um, work well with a Cunningham function with a Cunningham's fun transfer function defined of this form. And then lastly, the, we can do the integral over the radii and define a specific flux density. So in order to prove that the mob has a finite flux we have to prove that Cunningham's transfer function and the specific density, specific flux density are non-vanishing um, at the value of the mob. So to do that, what I can do uh, is zoom in close to the mob. If I zoom in generically, the parameterization of the disk by redshift and source radius looks basically like a rectangular coordinate system. However, if I zoom into the mob, I get one rectangular uh, coordinate system, the radii, while the blue on the other hand looks like um, the radial coordinates, a radial coordinate, and so it's, it's singular at this point. Nonetheless, if, you're, if you carefully take the limits, you can still get the proper values. So I can expand near the mob. I can expand um, G. Um, let's say the mob occurs at a point on the screen alpha naught, beta naught. Then the source radius of the mob uh, has this form rough uh, approximately, and the value of the mob has approximately this form. And then if I carefully take the limit approaching the mob point along uh, the, the radial direction, the radial coordinate that the mob has, um, I can calculate that the transfer function has a non-vanishing value of this form. And similarly, if I take the limit in the direction transverse, in the beta zero direction towards the mob, I can know that the specific flux density is also non vanishing and has a value of this form. So, all in all, to wrap things up, let me give you some conclusions. We're able to semi analytically describe the mob for all spins and inclinations for this simple toy model of the accretion disk where the emitters are circular equatorial orbiters. We learn that the lensed images become important for calculating the value of the mob if the disk is transparent for high spin and high inclination. We learn that the mob is a particularly nice value for observational searching because it has a non-vanishing flux. And we, we have learned exactly how it encodes spin and inclination in that a low value of the mob is of inclination, while a higher value of the mob constrains the spin and inclination in terms of one another. And then lastly, 
in the future, one could hope to study uh, a model that has some kind of form of what the emitters should be doing beyond the ISCO. It's not necessarily true that there's no emission in the region beyond the ISCO. There is traditional thinking that the reason it's much less is because once the emitters no longer can travel in circular orbits, they relative they spiral it or plunge it in towards the black hole relatively fast, but this doesn't mean they're not emitting. So we could hope to look for the mob, val the, the values of redshift and blue shift that we would get from light from emitters in that region. We could do the equivalent treatment to see what the redshift can tell us. Of course, the redshift doesn't have the added value of having a finite flux, so this is less observationally attractive. And lastly, we could hope to use the methods we've used to study the whole part of, of the broadened line profiles. They are quite interesting. For instance, they have like these bites and these wiggles, and one might want to understand in detail through an analysis like this, where you keep track of which radii source the mob uh, or the, the blue shift or redshift you're looking at and which image is on to, to try to uh, elucidate why we have these features in the broad in line profiles. And lastly, let me, let me say, this is very, as I hope you can see, attached to experiment. Like I said, in the past 20 or so, uh, black holes have had their spins constrained using the redshift uh, and blue shift, mostly the redshift though, of, of the emission from around them because the gravitational well allows you to get really deep redshifts that are dependent on the spin of the black hole. But in the past, it hasn't been very easily doable that one could take the whole shape of these broadened profiles um, using experiments because of the spectral re resolution. Now, there is a proposed experiment called Athena with its XIFU instrument that looks to be able to resolve these curves to much higher detail. And in fact, these broad in line profiles from the code rel line are at the proposed resolution of, of Athena, um, such that these are not actually smooth curves. They are binned, but the bins are just fine enough that you're able to elucidate a really nice clean curve. Um, and if that's the case that Athena is able to do this, it really should be able to use the mob, for instance, as a very good indicator of, of some of the black hole parameters as outlined here. Thank you. Well, Delilah, well, this was great again. Um, uh, excellent stuff. Um, uh, so I did have a question. Yes. So one question about black holes, or, you know, like, um, actually, in, in particular, black hole spins. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the most accurate way we know of now of measuring um, a black hole spin? So actually, a black hole spin is much harder to measure than the um, mass. And in fact, we don't necessarily have a lot of great ways to constrain the spins. The X-ray reflection method is looking at the, especially the red amount of redshift you get um, in X-ray that has been done for 20 or so black holes thus far um, is probably the best one right now. Um, for instance, you know, black holes have this that bright ring you see in their in their images, but it turns out the the shape is very especially if you're viewing if you're viewing from near the pole the shape is very circular it's hard to tell whether it's really um being squished or not a little bit because of your viewing angle and the spin so really right now the x-ray reflection method is the best method we have for narrowing down spin and but there are there are new proposals for instance like i said these images of a black hole have multiple have multiple self similar images of the of the of the image superimposed on each other so for instance you could take a cut across this and you could you would see that the image is self similar stacked on top of itself um, and so uh, you could use try to use that as a way to help constrain especially if you also think about things like time dependence. Um, the light you get from like a flare within the disk, um, you would see it in the first image first and then there'd be a time delay before you see it in the next image and a time delay before you see it in the image after that. And the time delay is spin dependent. So if you could really nail down flares 
and see different rings really well resolved in this photon, subrings in this photon ring. That's another proposed method. But really right now, the X-ray reflection method is the best we have. Spin is much harder to pin down experimentally than mass. Okay, okay. And the mass is also difficult to, to measure as well. Yes, it no. In fact, um, this is, so MA7's mass was measured with two different methods. There was one about gas dynamics and one about stellar dynamics. I think it, if I remember correctly, once they um, did the, looked at, analyzed M87, it was the stellar dynamics one that got it right. But so it was kind of the case that they already knew it from the stellar dynamics. So if you have a lot of satellites around the black hole, like stars, that you can well track of course, this means you need a, a black hole close enough to us that we can also see stellar dynamics about it, around it. But if that's the case, you can narrow down the spin, uh, the mass pretty well, like we've done with our own galaxy. Okay. The Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Got you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Hi, uh, Delilah. Thank you for the presentation. I had one quick question. Um, yes. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, um, if you're familiar with the double copy, um, but essentially it's, it's just like a statement that there is some sort of, um, duality or relation between, um, gravity and gauge theories. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what, yeah. So, so for example, there's like, you can do like, um, get, you can go from a Coulomb particle to a, uh, her black hole um, and other sorts of things. And I was wondering, have you guys looked into, or is that something that would even be um, sensible to look at perhaps um, something more in the context of like looking at particles and then being able to extrapolate to some of the models that you're dealing with that have to do with gravity? Um, that's a good question. So certainly for the stuff we've done for this, we have not. Uh, done that. And um, I'm actually um, of these kinds of observable signatures like the mob or the photon ring. I'm, in these cases, I'm not very aware of how one would, would be able to use uh, these dualities to, to, uh, to tell us anything about the models or to extrapolate things, um, at least in the way that they would have any bearing on observational signatures. But I do think it's an interesting question and definitely something uh, that if one was able to do would be very exciting. Um, Delilah, there's a question in the chat about uh, um, the mob. Yeah. Will you read it to me, please? Sorry. It says, do you mind explaining the mob again after, uh, after you explain this side? It's a question from a student. Sure. So basically what the mob is, mob just means maximum observable blue shift. So if we, if we have, a, if we're viewing a black hole, we get its disk, uh, we get images of its disk, we get multiple of them, here showing the first two. This is the light that came straight to me without wrapping around the black hole. If the black hole's like on my hand, it came from here. All the light comes from the disk, kind of just like this. This image here is the underside of the disk. So the light came from under the black hole, wrapped around the black hole, and then came to me. And you can also have light that wraps around multiple times and so forth before reaching the observer. And so on all of these images or any given one of these images of a black hole, what I wanna ask if, is if I view the black hole, this is what the disk would look like to me and a far away observer. I just wanna know which point in I just want to know which point on the uh, on the disk is gives me the maximum has maximum blue shift, and I just want to know what the value of that blue shift is. Uh, hi, Miss uh, Miss Gates. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much. <laughs> I've just been so humbled because I'm a political science student, so this isn't in my forte at all. But it just made me really interested in just learning more about what you study. And my question for you is, um, it's not necessarily academic, but my question is. What makes you passionate about learning about this? Or what just makes you wake up in the morning and say, let me learn more about mobs and black holes in general? Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, no need to say Miss Gates. You could just uh, call me Delilah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't feel that old yet. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm joking. Thank you. Um, um, also, thank you for coming. Oh, my. Um, you know, 
So when I first started um, thinking about what I was going to study, I was in high school and trying to figure out what I was going to do for college. And what I thought was really interesting was chemistry and the makeup of atoms. What I learned about that when I what I was excited about was like the structure of the atoms and the electron clouds and people were like, really, that's quantum mechanics, which kind of led me down this path of like trying to understand how to describe the really small physics in the world um, using math. Um, because as you mathematically describe these things, it's like you have such a clarity of understanding about them that it's like you have another sensory, sensory organ through the math. Um, and so that's what really got me into theory, kind of into theory and got me thinking about um, analytic things that I can calculate analytically as opposed to purely numerics um, and got me thinking about the world of the small. And then when I was in graduate school, I also learned a little bit about cosmology and I was just like, the universe is so vast and there's such cool things happening around us. Um, and really for me, studying black holes analytically uh, in the way that I do using like general relativity is the merging of both those worlds where I can explore the big objects with the tools of really math and using the math to be able to see the world, how it works in a, its fine structure. Um, so Whoa, <laughs> that's so cool. It's so exciting. <laughs> And <laughs> what wakes me up in the morning is that doing this is so cool. School is very hard and you have to study a lot and you're often learning things that other people have already covered. But once you start doing research, you're like, you open a door and you're doing stuff that no one's done before. And there's just, it's just so exciting when you find stuff. I literally throughout this project would figure things out. Like when I analytically figured out, you could tell which image uh, you got the mob from when you're viewing from the equatorial plane, when I figured out how to do that, I literally was skipping around my house because I was like, no one has seen this before. And I had a hunch about it and I figured it out. And it's just so cool. So that's what gets me up in the morning. It's just so cool. And then may I ask another question? Sure. So I saw on your slide, like, like, um, and it's your slide, it says black holes are everywhere. So like my, like, I guess my misunderstanding or my mis like my misconstruction is, that black holes are like only in space or in the galaxy. So are you telling me like right now, like I'm in a black hole or like, like how, how, how does that work if they're yeah, everywhere? That's not what I'm telling you. When I say everywhere, I just mean everywhere in the universe. So um, we have to remember that we are a small part of the universe and the universe is very big. We are not the center of it. We are very <laughs> generic in our spot. Um, and so if we look around us, there are other galaxies similar to us. And each of these, like our own, has a supermassive black hole in the center of it. And further, throughout every one of these galaxies, there are millions more smaller black holes. So in our galaxy, black holes from the mass of about 10 times the sun to order of hundreds of times the sun, there are about 10 million of those that's also floating around our galaxy. So when I say there you go, I mean in the whole universe, oh, okay. um, not that we're in one. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Hey, Delala, this is Costadinos. Hi. It's a great presentation. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, I was wondering what will happen in your analysis if you turn on the charge of a black hole. So if you go from a Kerr solution to a Kerr Newman solution. This is a very we'll good question. This is a very good question. So I don't exactly know what would happen. What I will say is that um, what I suspected would happen is um, the mob values that you've calculated here, you would get some things kind of similar. Um, turning on the charge um, probably affects, may, I don't know, remember exactly, but you know, it probably has some effect on the rate at which a circular stable, a stable circular yeah. orbiter uh, is how fast it's moving. If it, if it move, if you have a charge that causes them to spin faster or a little slower, that moves the mob up and down a little bit. And so really what you get is you get similar curves like these for each of the for the additional adding of each of the charges. Um, and then you have a big space that's very degenerate. Um, yeah, that's I think what I thought. That maybe some effects that you have here. I think it'd be very be... hard. I... Yeah, I was, I was saying that maybe some effects uh, that you have here uh, could be masked by the charge effect. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, it's definitely possible, but um, I, I don't have a hunch for exactly yeah, how that, yeah. for, yeah, unfortunately I don't have a hunch. Though I do think this is an interesting question in general because if you can characterize 
these so let me first say the for everyone there's a the Kerr black hole is specifically the the black hole that is non-charged and spinning um and there is the hypothesis in nature that most of the black holes around us should be Kerr like they should not should just be spinning and be non-charged just because this is the case doesn't mean we can't for black holes that also have an electric charge, for instance. And that's what Constantinos was asking me about. And the question is, uh, how do these, like the mob change if, if the black hole had um, uh, had a charge as well as was spinning? Um, and for this observational signature, as well as other observational signatures, if one could carefully characterize them for the cases of non curved black holes, one could hope to uh, if the degeneracy space is not too bad and experiments get better, to use it to try to justify whether the Kerr hypothesis that we expect to be true is actually true. And I also have another question. Yes. Um, is it possible that the mob could, you, could be used as a tool to study the merger of black holes in companion uh, to, uh, you know, gravity waves? This is a really good question. Um, so, First, let me say the you would definitely have to in that case do the calculation completely analytically, um, because I mean completely numerically, uh, because we don't have a description of a just the space time for a merger that is um, completely analytic. That's always done numerically pertur perturbatively, and so um, I think I think it probably can be done. But then because one is doing it numerically it it becomes hard i think to disentangle what effects are specifically from the the physics you put into the disk model as opposed to what is just from the general relativity okay. um and here we were really trying to be agnostic to our to you know the mechanisms for which the light was produced just saying these are the types of sources light comes from them and i don't think with mergers, you can do that. It, we don't have the technology analytically to have such a pristine general relativistic description uh, of the case for such a di for for dynamic for really dynamical systems of black holes, as opposed to the very stationary Kerr solution. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, can I actually ask one more question, Delilah? Sure. So my question is like. So I'm still an undergrad, like undergraduate student, but my question is, how do you go about choosing like your your research topic, whether it's like from choosing like the best Starburst flavor to something as big and as extreme as like like trying to study black holes? Like, how do you go about that process? <clears throat> I think the first thing one should do is just talk to a lot of people. Uh, talk like professors love to talk to people. Postdocs love to talk to people. So the first thing is to, you know, from what you've studied in your classes, try to figure out what you think is interesting. So when I was in grad school, I said I thought, you know, high energy theory, the description of particles and things like that was interesting, but I also thought cosmology was interesting. So I talked to a bunch of different professors and I, and I talked to ask them what kind of research they do, talk to postdocs and such. Um, and then from there, it's just once you kind of figured out what kind of problems there are that you could possibly work on with your skill set at the time, then it's just approaching people and asking if uh, they have space for someone to work with them. Um, and, you know, the worst they can tell you is no, and the best they can tell you is yes. And um, so, so really, it's uh, about, you know, from your knowledge and your classes, figuring out what you think is interesting, and then, you know, not feeling like you have to come up with a whole research project by yourself. That's d definitely not what happens. We um, have advisors and what and and professors and whatnot to guide us and po postdocs to bounce ideas off of, especially as a younger student. So you talk to them, you figure out what problems <coughs> are out there, what you have the skill set to work on, and you ask for the ones you think are interested if you're allowed to work on them. That's in fact what I did with my with the people, the different people I approached, and then with my ultimate advisor, Andy Strominger. Once I'd done my other rotations and I knew I wanted to work with him. Um, he had several different projects and I was like, you know, of the projects I know you're thinking about, the ones that your students have done in the past, these are the ones that I find interesting. Do you have another one of this ilk that I could join? Thank you. Yeah. Delilah, I have a question. Sure. 
how much equipment does it take to get the just the data you have for this mob data? Ah, this is all done on my laptop. I mean, the observational equipment. Oh, man, I have no idea. Um, honestly, since this is related to um, these brought in, these whole brought in um, line profiles, it, it ta will take uh, an experiment like Athena, which was going to be on a, on a satellite, um, billions of dollars. Yeah. So it takes one of these state of the art kinds of experiments that has to be lobbied for through NASA or someone um, and proposed. It takes, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it takes a, a big piece of equipment, an expensive piece of equipment. All right, um, I guess I will uh, stop there. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Wow, this was great.